Hello everybody. Um, welcome to today's lecture. This is today business taxation and this is a lecture for the second semester. So um, we will just expect that you have some basic knowledge from general introduction to tax law lecture but naturally we will also uh, do some repetition in between. Today, um, chapter one is simply the basics which you need, something which you must be reminded of, because um, if you get that uh, mixed up, then probably nothing will be right. So, what's business taxation about at all? Naturally, the taxation of a business. But, um, Taxation of a business might include many, many different taxes. We concentrate here on the taxation of profits of a business. So the title is a bit too general. Um, meant is only the income taxation of a business. So we leave out all the other stuff for later years or semesters. So taxes on property like um, taxes on the invested capital, um, capital transfer taxes, real estate transfer taxes, inheritance taxes if the owner dies, um, value added tax, a very important tax. This is a subject of an own lecture. So all that is excluded. We only talk about profit taxation. Which taxes are relevant? Well, if it's only taxation of the income, then naturally we think of income tax. Uh, in German, that would be called Einkommensteuer. And we are going to use German tax law as an example for all what we are talking about. And later we can think about parallels in other states. Now there is also a corporation tax called Körperschaftsteuer in German. And as an additional tax, which is David from all who run a business, there is also a tax levied by the cities that's called trade tax in the English translation. The German word would be Gewerbesteuer, which is probably a bit difficult to pronounce for people from other states. So trade tax will probably that um, term be, which we use mostly. Who has to pay? Well, income tax has to be paid by natural persons. Corporation tax by juridical persons. You already heard that in general introduction to tax law. So juridical persons pay that. Whereas trade tax, surprise, will be taken from everybody. So irrespective of if you are a natural or a juridical person, you pay that additional tax on your business profits to the city or the cities where you own the business. The official name for these taxes, as I already told you, is Einkommensteuer in German. So you find it in the Einkommensteuergesetz or ESTG, so Income Tax Act or Income Tax Law. Sometimes you also find unofficial translated abbreviations like ITA, Income Tax Act. I regard that as not so elegant because um, everybody can translate Einkommensteuergesetz differently. Um, and then you will have different abbreviations. And if you speak with a German and use the abbreviation ITA, then the German will have some few seconds and probably um, doesn't understand what you are talking about. But if you use the official abbreviation ESDG, Although you don't know how to pronounce Einkommensteuergesetz, then the German directly knows where you are talking about and everybody is fine with that. The way how German laws are cited is already known to you from the last semester. You would um, begin highest level of a unit is the paragraph. The paragraph in the German law is what is the section in an English or American law. So um, surprisingly or confusingly, um, the Germans call a paragraph what the others call a section and what the others call a paragraph or a subparagraph, the Germans call a section. Um, 
that the case. So there will be a permanent confusion if Germans try to translate. Uh, because if you have a German who is familiar with the Anglo-American style of expressing things, that person will say, I speak of section 1, paragraph 1, ESTG. And if not, or if you have somebody from the Anglo-American uh, part of the world who is familiar with the German style, that person probably changes over to the German style, then speaks of paragraph 1, section 1. So you can probably only get it from the context and you would in all probability try to obtain the meaning from the context. The bigger unit named first is the paragraph. Even if you use the word section to call it, so if you even call that bigger unit or higher unit in the Anglo-American Anglo style, it is strongly recommendable for German law text to use a paragraph sign there. And then every German directly knows where what you're speaking about. So the citation style would be paragraph one, section one, sentence one or sentence two, so that you immediately can identify to which concrete part of the text act you refer. Or this alternatively here would be paragraph two, section two, number two of the ESCG. Okay. Corporation tax, Körperschaftsteuer, would be in German Körperschaftsteuergesetz. That's the name of the law or the tax act. Official abbreviation in German. Everybody knows it, KSDG. So I strongly recommend to use that and not to create alternative translated and translate uh, abbreviations like Corporate Income Tax Act, CITA or so. Nobody probably knows that who does not always have conversations with you, especially you. All the others probably tell, speak of KSDG. So when you have a telephone call with somebody in Germany, use the German abbreviation. It greatly helps. And even if you write a text only for English readers or American readers, just use the abbreviation KSDG and then explain it once and for all. That probably greatly helps. Citation style is again, you begin with the paragraph sign and then in brackets you would add um, the section and probably there are either numbers or sentences or sentences with a list of different numbers, all that exists. But then you would pronounce that paragraph one, section four, number four, KSDG, so of the KSDG, or paragraph 8B, section one, sentence two, KSDG. Might be that in the heat of the fight, that you then mix it up and speak of section one, paragraph one, or section 8B, paragraph one, that is still identifiable from the context. The thing which you name first is the higher unit, but uh, in written form, I would always recommend to use that German style and begin with the paragraph, style, paragraph sign. Then everybody has clear what you are talking about. And yeah, naturally, trade tax Gewerbesteuer can be found in the Gewerbesteuergesetz, Trade Tax Act. And surprisingly, the abbreviation is now GEV, GEW, STG. Uh, hard to pronounce, so probably you get used to calling that simply Trade Tax Act and using the abbreviation in written form. Um, citation style would be again paragraph 2, section 2. Gewerbesteuergesetz or Trade Tax Act paragraph, yeah, or Paragraph 2, Section 2, Gewerbe Trade Tax Act. Yeah. As you can easily see from all these abbreviations, the G at the end of an abbreviation in a legal context usually stands for the German word Gesetz, which means law or tax act. So ESDG, KSDG, GEV. GEW, sorry, STG, 
is always the law on these taxes and the st in the middle with the um, capital s and the small t is the standard abbreviation in that context at least only um, for soya which is tax okay so who has to pay what income tax natural persons corporation tax juridical persons now i already told you this three times but um, what is a juridical person? Do you remember? It's probably a hard uh, and a long time ago. So um, that was the same as what others call a legal person, a judicial person or a legal body. Sometimes you find additional denominations. Um, for some special forms of juridical persons, we also use the word company. So that's mostly for juridical person or we call them even capital companies all that are names for juridical persons um, but that did not yet answer what a juridical person really is first the thing does not really exist a juridical person is a fiction it is an entity which is just an invention an imagination completely fictitious so does not exist in the real world you can never see or touch a juridical person you can never meet one if you have the feeling you met a juridical person go to the doctor and change your medication or if you don't take medicine start to do so because it is not really existing so just a fiction the law forces us to do as if there were a person really existing which nobody can see which is just an entry in a register by which it was made yeah existent and so everybody has to do that silly game as if let's say deutsche bank ag or uh, copy shop cleavage gmbh really exist as persons a juridical person has in principle all the rights of a natural person apart from the things which due to the nature of the transaction are not possible for a juridical person for example um it's not possible to marry a juridical person at least up to now um <laughs> there you can still fight for your civil rights um and claim equal treatment but in all other cases yeah especially when it comes to contracts and all these things this fictitious person the juridic person has all the rights which a human being also could have so the idea that there were a person existing is carried through in a brutality which knows no problem so the the name juridic person by the way comes from the fact that this person only exists in the legal area its existence is founded on juridical norms so the reason for its existence is just the law outside the law you will never find it that is why it's a juridical person or a legal person it comes into existence on juridical ways unlike a natural person which really exists in nature and uh, which you can see in nature and find and um, talk with and so yeah now a juridic person has to be treated entirely as if it were a real actual person and so this juridic person is completely different from the persons who founded it or created it it's a different thing like the difference between parents and children parents brought their children into the world but they are different if children do something wrong the parents are not responsible because the children are different every person is only responsible for his or her own mistakes and the same is then the case with such a juridical person 
So completely different from the persons who founded it. So the debts of a juridical person are not the ones of the founders or the owners, as the debts of a child are not the debts of the parents. At least if the parents did not take over some own liabilities by giving a guarantee or... In principle, every person has to care for him or her or itself. So that's the trick. Now, a juridical person has all the rights to do everything in business, which also a natural person can do. It can even form an association with other persons. Now, it has a fundamental, uh, let's say, handicap. It has no brain. Um, and indeed, this is sometimes a problem. Now, you probably think of some well-known friend or so, where you think, okay, Charles or Irving or so also has no brain and gets along very decently with that, but no, with a juridical person, there is really absolutely no brain, not even a physical existence, so it has great problems to form a will. Now, for, for the law, that's not a problem because the law knows the problem. There are always persons who cannot speak for themselves and cannot take care of their own rights so that others have to take care of them. Go back to the example parents, children, as long as you were a child, your parents were by law appointed as your representatives. So in all the matters which affected you, your parents could decide for you and speak in your name and in your behalf, on your behalf. So when your parents said, in the name of my child, I start a lawsuit, it was not your parents who started the lawsuits because it was you. Your parents was just, they were just the messenger of your will. They could think for you and what they decided was your decision legally because they represented you. The same trick um, is also used for juridical persons. The only difference is a juridical person never grows up. It will be a minor without a brain during its whole existence. So one of the major issues which the law has to define is, for example, which legal representative, one, several or so, can decide or act as representative for such a juridical person under which conditions, under which circumstances, and so on. So that's then highly important. You need a set of legal rules. Huh? Um, but the trick with the legal representatives greatly helps. So if they decide in the name of a GmbH or an AG or a limited company, it is the legal entity which speaks. It is the GmbH which acts, hmm? not the representative. Hmm? Okay, so um, if you are now a legal representative, you know everybody has the ability to enable somebody else to speak for him or her in a general way, which is highly risky, or limited to a very, very small field of transactions or even to a single transaction. You can give somebody the power of attorney. You can negotiate a certain business for me. You can sign it and that is done in my name. So it will be my declaration of will. It will be me acting by your, by your mouth. Um, the legal representatives of a juridical person can do the same. They can pass on a part of their powers to employees or to others so they can multiply the power to represent that juridical person. And usually when you deal with an employee of a company, then you will see at the end the employee signs a contract and um, with you. And nevertheless, you signed the contract with that GmbH or Limited or AG because that employee has been given 
either by um, the managing director, who is the, uh, the, of the legal representative appointed by law, has been given a part of that representative power by that legal representative, or there has been a kind of, of chain of um, powers shared. For example, the managing director appointed um, the head of a department, gave that head of the department several powers of attorney, and also allowed to pass on a bit of these powers to an employee, usually the employee uh, working for a GmbH gets the power to sign um, contracts in a certain limited way on that area where that person has to work on. Uh, but in the in principle, always you make contracts with that legal person, with that juridical person, because all the people you see only represent that legal person. So um, if you have a bank, let's so the go on the bank, then the customer sees, for example, Mr. Smith, the employee, but in the end, the person who signs the contract will be go on the bank. Okay. Yeah, um, important is now that you are able to recognize what a juridical person is and how it can be created, because if you have one, then you need KSTG, Corporation Tax Act. If you don't have a juridical person, but if a natural person acts on his or her own behalf, then you do the business with a natural person. And then it's a matter for the income tax act. So completely different cases, and we will have completely different chapters on that in our lecture. So important is which juridical persons exist and how can they be created? The first important thing is naturally the only authority which can force us that we all share that really strange belief that there is a fictitious person although it really does not exist that can only be ordered by the law such a nonsense can only be forced upon us by the law so you need a legal basis for that so indeed, you have a law on stock corporations in German, the Aktiengesetz. You have a law on the existence and the rules for a GmbH, a limited company. You have a law or, or legal provisions on under which circumstances a private club can be treated as a juridical person and all that. No? So the state has to create rules and you have to follow these rules. Usually a juridical person only begins to exist after an official registration by a state authority. So you need to know these types of juridical persons in order to recognize them. Um, the state usually creates different juridical person types because for different purposes, you need different set of rules. For example, if a juridical person is meant to do business in a huge extent, then you need to be more cautious with how they deal with money, um, how there can be guarantees for the creditors, as if you have to do with a private chess club or so, where it's not about money at all, probably a bit of money is affected, but where private leisure time occupation is the main object of that um, association. So different rules for different purposes. And so every juridical person is probably defined by a set of rules, which defines who will be representative under the law, for which purposes, um, to which transactions is such a representative entitled, which activities are forbidden or expected from such a juridical person, and so on. All that is in these different sets of rules. Uh, so different purposes require different offers of um, uh, a different legal framework of rules, which fits the purpose. How can you recognize that you deal with such a juridical person? And the answer is simple. You have to learn it by heart. What is a juridical person and what not? Um, most states say 
for reasons of legal certainty, we oblige legal persons to carry an abbreviation or a clear indication in their name which shows that they are a juridical person and which type of juridical person they are. So um, it is not Deutsche Bank, but Deutsche Bank AG. AG stands for Aktiengesellschaft Stock Corporation in Germany. Or the Allianzversicherung is not the Allianz, that's colloquial, but in reality it's Allianzversicherung AG, probably. I don't know if that's the original official name, um, but at least you have that abbreviation at the end or somewhere in the firm's name, which makes it clear what the legal form is. So everybody knows this is a juridical person and it's a stock corporation. ADAC, the representation of the German uh, car driver. So the Allgemeiner Deutsche Automobilclub, the general German automobilist association is an EV, so a registered private association, originally having no economic interest. Um, if you establish a copy shop and you want to have it as a legal, as a limited company, then in Germany the name would be Copy Shop Smith, for example, GmbH, which then signalizes to everybody this is a juridical person with whom you do here business. Yeah. Now, Keep in mind, if you recognize that something is a juridical person, this will be taxed under the KSTG, so Corporation Tax Act. If not, then not. So, if you mix that up, huh, you will be in the completely wrong movie. Because if you treat a partnership of natural persons as a company, and apply the KSTG, or if you ever apply a KSTG rule to a natural person, huh? this is um, as if you say, I'm Protestant and I have a Pope. It does not fit. Hmm? Um, it's a sin. Nobody will ever believe you in you again. They like think this is really a great mistake. So. Keep these things apart. Never apply KSDG rules to natural persons. Of course, different movie. So, um, in the course of time, memorize the common abbreviations for legal persons. For example, in Germany, a limited company, which you found with 25,000, a Gesellschaft mit beschränkter Haftung is a GmbH. A stock corporation is an AG, an Aktiengesellschaft. You need a minimum capital of 50,000 for it. Um, there is also a registered cooperative society, Eingetragene Genossenschaft. A cooperative is an association which has the aim to support it, the business of its members. So they can only do business with their own members. They can make a profit, but they are only to support members. An EV is a registered private association for non-economic purposes, like a chess club or so. Would in Germany be an EV? And other legal forms are possible. In England or Ireland, you know probably a limited company, LTD, is the same as a GmbH, but with a far lower minimum capital because the minimum amount of capital which you need in order to establish such a legal entity that can be set free by every um, state. PLC is public limited company that would be the same or the parallel to what is AG in Germany, a corporation where shares are traded or can be traded in a stock exchange or freely sold. Um, an EG would probably have as its parallel a cooperative society. I don't know if there is a generally accepted abbreviation for that. Couldn't find it. Um, the same with a club. There are different forms of clubs, um, sports clubs or so. Sometimes FC is um, a common abbreviation football club. Well, but um, 
I'm not sure how the legal abbreviation is there and if there is indeed in every other state the rule that you are forced to name the abbreviation uh, but usually is to be expected. When you cross over or turn over to Europe there are also some not many legal forms which exist directly under EU law. That would be an SE, that's Latin for Societas Europae. Um, Latin language has the advantage it's neutral because it's um, the language of no existing member state of the EU and for that it is um, equal treatment for all of them. And the abbreviation SE is taken from Latin and means Aktiengesellschaft. AG in Latin. So if you have an SE abbreviation at the end, this was corporation established under European Union law. SCE is also a form of European Union law, a cooperative established under EU law. Other legal forms uh, are possible, but uh, do not really exist at the moment, I think. French forms, Société à Responsabilité Limitée, is the nice French way to express limited company. SA, Société Anonyme, is a stock corporation and it's called Anonymous Society, Société Anonyme, because uh, with a publicly traded limited company, you don't know who the owner of the shares are, and so it's anonymous. Therefore, you have here the abbreviation SA. Many different forms exist for cooperatives in France. Don't know um, the exact forms. Sorry, there's a blank in my knowledge, a gap. When it comes to the Netherlands or to the Dutch speaking part of Belgium, well, in Belgium, they say they don't speak Dutch, they speak Flemish, but at least they have sometimes a comparable yield firms. There is a BV, that's a parallel for a GmbH in the Netherlands, Besloten of Vinoltschap, or Namlose Vinoltschap, that would be AG, the word by word translation of the French SA. And other things probably exist there too. SRL. Yeah, in Italian. Oh God, how is it pronounced? I forgot that. Um, Societa Responsabilità Limitata, I don't know. And SPA, Societa Par Azioni. Um, Aktiengesellschaft in German or Stock Corporation in English. PLC, the same. This is the abbreviation in Italy for a cooperative society. Then we naturally also have the Americans. There I only know the most important legal form, that's a corporation, a stock corporation. It might also be abbreviated as Inc. Incorporated. So here you have a small overview of the most important legal forms. There are many, many, because we have 200 states at least in the earth. And all of them have their system of legal entities, of juridical persons. So whenever you come across the abbreviation for a legal form, try to find out if it is a juridical person or if it is, for example, the abbreviation for a partnership, because then it's completely different. And that is what you need to know. So many, many others have to be or can be seen, you will never know them all, but if you come across some um, business from another state, look to the owner's name, is there a strange abbreviation, then try to find out for what it stands, is it a juridical person or not. Because we must know that. Now, a business, when does it have to pay income tax? That's the wrong question. The business itself is a multitude of things. A business can't pay a tax. Only a person can pay a tax. Only persons can have rights and obligations. 
So we have to ask for the owner of the business who owns that factory, who owns that houses, who owns that bookshop. Um, is that a natural person or a juridical person? Then you are on the right track. And then you can ask yourself, okay, if the owner is a natural person, then this owner will have to pay income tax on the business profit. So when the owner is a natural person, now what was a natural person, a person which exists in nature or by nature? So this is in a very vulgar way to put it, a human being, man, woman, child, um, nothing else. When is a human the owner of a business? Is that possible? Um, and here there is a very, very big, yeah, nearly offensive mistake, which some people always do or make. They have the strange idea that a business can only be held by a juridical person. And ladies and gentlemen, this is simply completely wrong. I am a human being and I have rights. I can conclude contracts with any other person. And if I don't turn completely mad, nobody can take that right away from me. And if I make a contract with another person, I can make a profitable contract. And so I can make a business. I can start a business just by becoming active myself. This is probably what we all do when we start a business. Um, yeah, It might be that the local tradition in the one or other state says, before I take a hammer and repair a car, I first go and register a limited company. Exists, but in principle, as long as you don't set up a juridical person which in which name you then run your business. If you didn't do this, then you act on your own behalf for yourself. Then it's you who runs the business. So whenever somebody writes, businesses pay corporation tax and private persons pay income tax, then this person deserves to die because this is a fundamental mistake. Humans can do business. Okay, so never, never, ever stick to that mistake. If you ever find yourself with the idea that's not my business, it is your business. You can do business, ladies and gentlemen, so humans can run an enterprise. How do you recognize this in a text? The answer is clear. Who is legally active? If it's not a juridical person who does something, then the human being does something. So if a text says Mr. Smith hires an employee, then not Mr. Smith GmbH hires an employee, but Mr. Smith. And Mr. Smith is a human being. So in that case, Mr. Smith has an employee. If Mr. Smith buys a house, it's Mr. Smith who buys the house. So a natural person, not the Smith GmbH. Okay. Mrs. Miller buys a factory building. Then Mr. Smith, Mrs. Miller is the owner of the factory. And the profit of the factory will be owned by Mrs. Miller. There is no room for corporation tax in that case. So you see it in the case definition. Um, the last legal form, which you remember from last semester, is, is there is also something like a partnership. A partnership is several persons act together or unite in order to achieve or at least follow a common aim. So several persons. Persons can be natural persons and juridical persons. So, Indeed, I myself could form a partnership with a GmbH. Naturally, that GmbH can only express its will by its representative. But I can 
form an, a partnership with a GmbH or with two other human beings or with two humans and two GmbHs, everything's possible. The decisive thing is all of us, at least two persons, agree on let's do something together voluntarily. So we set a common aim and unite our efforts to achieve it. Not everybody must do the same and as much as the other one, but we agree on, we try to realize a common aim together. Then we form a partnership. Um, in German law, one would distinguish a partnership from a community. Community would mean several persons. Um, are thrown involuntarily or at least not voluntarily into a situation where they share common rights and obligations or where they come or end up in a situation in common. If you are stuck in the elevator together with three other persons, this is not a partnership. This is a community of the persons being stuck in the elevator. Hmm? Um, but now if you, if you are free, the elevator is again working and you say it was such a nice atmosphere, let's stay in this at, part, um, elevator together and um, play cards. Then you would be partnership because now you say let's join together and do something together. In that case your aim would be a very childish aim, <laughs> let's do Let's play cards in an elevator. What would uh, already be sufficient to fulfill the definition of a partnership? By the way, here you see when a partnership has reached its aim and the partnership ends. Um, now, if your aim is let's run an enterprise together, this is by definition an aim which has not a time limit. Hmm? Um, so that partnership only ends when it is cancelled or when it gets insolvent or other special things. Okay. If a partnership has the aim to run an enterprise and sometimes the legislator offers standardized sets of rules on which the partners can or should agree, you can very often opt out of certain rules, but if you don't opt out of them, then in all cases of doubt, the law assumes that you automatically have to be treated under these standard rules. That is very convenient because very often when you form a partnership, you forget to um, think about every potential problem in the future. And so such a default set of rules on which you fall back if nobody agreed on a different rule is very convenient. Um, frequent forms are the so-called simple partnership or partnership under the rules of the civil code, BGB. That's just what I explained in the beginning. Several partners join together in order to follow a common aim. This aim can be everything. Um, you are sitting in a restaurant with three people at a table and the waiter or the waitress was very nice and when the waiter is away, you say to all the others, what about giving him or her a really good tip? Let's collect money and then give him a good, or her a good tip. Then you just form a simple partnership. Well, all the people at the table join together with the aim to collect money and to give a tip together, a generous tip to the waiter or waitress. Um, never mention that at the restaurant table the others will shrink back from terror uh, if it's a partnership something legal then we are not going to do it eh? or if you ever propose to somebody else okay the exam is now over let's go to let's go to a pub and have a drink until we fall down um the proposal let's go together to a pub and have some drinks is the proposal to form a partnership on the BGB. Let's go together and have some drinks. Already fulfills this requirement. Um, naturally, <laughs> it's not really a problem in real life. 
Good. Now, um, naturally, you can buy houses together and let them to tenants. So a GBR um, would then earn rental income and that would own, be owned by the partners together. So every partner would achieve rental income together with the other partners and so they would be taxed on that under income tax. If um, you have special aims, sometimes there are special sets of rules. For example, if your aim is to run an enterprise of major importance, so not a very unimportant one, automatically, if you don't opt out of this, your enterprise, your partnership would be called a general partnership or a commercial partnership, where every partner is fully entitled to represent the partners and where every part partner is fully liable for all the debts of the uh, partnership to all outsiders. If you don't like that, there is also the limited partnership in German called Kommanditgesellschaft, abbreviated KG. And the part this is a partnership where only some of the partners, at least one, is a general partner with full responsibility and full authority to represent the partnership. Whereas there are the other category is limited partners and the limited partners only have to pay in some capital and get a share in the profit. They usually don't take part in the management decisions. The only right they have is if the partnership contract is fundamentally changed. So if very important decisions are to be taken, which change the character of the partnership to which they agreed fundamentally, then they have a vetoing right. So if you become a KG partner in a bookshop um, without your permission, they cannot change this partnership into um, a wine trade because that would be completely different. Uh, some special forms like a professional partnership that exists for the free professions also sometimes with certain limited liability alternatives and that good the biggest mistake which you can make again to mistake the one legal form for another so never do this yeah. if you treat a partnership as a corporation and surprise my students very often do that because naturally i have a very bad character i try to lead you up the garden path so sometimes your brain hears some keywords and then goes mad. For example, uh, a GmbH must have a seat, a so-called status or receipt, where it's registered the official postal address and a place of management. In the Corporation Tax Act, that has an enormous uh, importance. Now, a partnership can also have an official seat, but for the taxation of a partnership, the seat and the place of management has no importance whatsoever. Now, a partnership can have a seat, but it has no importance. But your brain, ladies and gentlemen, is trained to, ah, seat. I know that from the Corporation Tax Act, there is highly important. So your brain wakes up and shouts, or somebody in your brain, a little brain cell, wakes up and shouts, I know that corporation toxic. And then everything goes wrong because if I said A, B, C, O, H, G have the seat and the place of management of Kleve, O, H, G is a partnership. They can have a seat, but it does not matter. And as it does not matter, the only things which you associate really with seat and place of management are corporation tax rules. Now, they don't apply here. It is a partnership. So KSDG is completely out of the question. Never, never mix them up. So the first important step is always, do I have to deal with a juridical person, with a natural person or with a partnership? And then you can think about which tax act is applied and that's the fundamental first step. If you make a mistake there, if you are careless there, if I can confuse you there, or 
Worse, if reality can refuse you there and you mix up the legal forms, then everything is in the waste bin. Your whole case solution will be completely useless. So if there is an exam case with 20 points, you get not a single one of them. So you can directly then come back next semester. So be careful. Learn the legal forms by heart. Have a look again into the lecture of last year, general introduction to text law. There was a chapter, I believe it was chapter two on the legal forms. Repeat it, be cautious. Now, um, we should not finish today because without having a look at which things do we have to talk about in the course of the lecture. First, naturally, you can always distinguish the ordinary everyday business and the extraordinary business occasions. Ordinary business is just current profit. So doing the everyday jobs, what happens to the normal income from usual activities? Then naturally, at least once a year or so, an enterprise pays out the profits which it made or a part of them to the partners or to the shareholders now Paying out profits to partners is again completely different stuff from paying out profit to shareholders. So it makes sense to think about both. And you can very often also make contracts between the partnership and the partners or between the company and its shareholders. Again, depending on the legal form, these things are completely differently treated, at least in the German um, area, uh, but that might also be the same in other states. Usually in other states, in an abstract way, one says entities can be transparent, that is, they are treated like we treat a partnership, or they can be intransparent, separate, individual, like juridical persons then they are treated as a corporation. And contracts between a partnership and a partner and a corporation and shareholder are completely different things. Extraordinary occasions. You found a new enterprise. How does it work? Probably that's not so complicated, but when you finish, you know, when you wind up an enterprise, cancel everything, sell it. Um, how is that treated? We have to deal with that too. You can um, end your activities in an enterprise in different forms. You can either sell the whole thing to a new owner. You can sell all the assets individually, or you can, um, for example, yeah, sell shares in a partnership or in a company, if there is one. So all these things should be looked on. What else can make problems? Um, a company can move to another country. Also, that is a very extraordinary, rare event and triggers some consequences. Also, a shareholder can move to another company, uh, to another country. Also, that can play a role. So. This is a small overview about things which we can talk about. Naturally, by the way, in the end, and this is not on the slides, we can also compare. For example, corporation tax has a far lower rate than income tax. You, we will speak about the reasons for that later. But now what is more favorable? Establish a company a GmbH and pay corporation tax and later income tax on the dividend, or directly establish a partnership or a sole tradership where I don't pay corporation tax but directly pay income tax. Unfortunately, income tax is higher than corporation tax, but corporation tax plus later income tax on the dividend might be higher than paying only. And so sometimes you need some, to make some calculations and we also should have to talk about this at least at the end of the lecture so that you also should get accustomed to what 
used to using your knowledge about taxation for decisions. Good ladies and gentlemen. So this was much or enough for today. You see we have probably much to do during the semester. So um, enjoy looking forward to that. And uh, never mix up the legal forms. That's the basic message of today. Never means never. And I hope that you could enjoy this lecture a bit. It will be continued soon, I hope. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you not yet have done this, because um, then you get a notification. At least I hope that you press the bell for getting notified whenever I load up something new. And the standard recommendation at the end, recommend this channel to others whom you like or recommend it to others whom you not like, whatever you prefer. And goodbye for today. See you again soon. Thanks for watching. Till next time.